So I think we're going to get started. And um, again, if you have questions, write them down. Feel free to bring them into our uh, virtual cafe. Um, we have a br brilliant guest today, and uh, it's an honor definitely to be in his presence again because I learn so much every time we have a session and um, some learning development. But there's also, um, I'll just kind of be off the cuff right now. Um, earlier we checked and we had a conversation that we wanted to provide this space to talk about mental health in the context of COVID-19, but we also didn't want it to feel too contrived. We wanted to be very real and open up space for people to feel comfortable talking about some of the challenging areas. So rather than read a tr traditional bio, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about um, Dr. Eodigi Arirende um, as a, an associate professor from the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Um, I'll also mention that you know he was the medical director of the Early Psychosis Intervention Program of Southeast Ontario, and his research interests are various, including mental health, cannabis, psychosis, knowledge translation, and cultural mental health. But um, you know, regardless of the many institutions that he's worked with, um, First Nations communities that he's partnered with and initiatives that, that has been a leading and, and, and supporting around the world, um, there's a certain calling when somebody you know, takes it upon themselves to provide service, not just in the professional academic lens, but also a very human lens. And that was a really important part of our introductory conversation of trying to bring a sense of like humanity to the conversation as well, rather than just surface level um, procedures and um, you know, uh, ideas of, practices that you should do that might not be connected to how you're experiencing the same issues in and of yourself. So that's kind of a bit of a context that I want to explain and, and, and hopefully encourage people to make space to, to really engage in this conversation in an authentic way. At the last minute, we were going to be doing more of a webinar format, but we decided, you know, let's have a more dynamic conversation. So we'll be able to see other faces. So um, this is just an introduction to encourage people to engage and also join me in welcoming our guest, uh, Dr. Ayo Denji um, Ayarende. Whew. Thanks, Cyril. Um, and life's certainly very different when you have a mask on and when you have a mask off. Um, thanks for the invitation. and. It's only an opportunity to keep things real. My quick disclaimer, whatever I do say is not as a representative of Queen's University, neither is it a representative of the hospitals I work in or the community in Kingston. Um, neither am I speaking for Yoruba, Nigerian, Africans or my family. So I take absolute full responsibility for whatever utterance I make. Um, we'll keep it real, we'll keep it dynamic um, and I think Cyril, um, pray nothing happens to me, but um, you've earned a position as a eulogy reader <laughs> if it were to happen. Um, so let's roll. Let's roll. Okay. Um, so our first question, just to kind of set the context, um, it was funny when we just had a check-in conversation, um, we were talking about how things have kind of shifted and we didn't get into a lot of uh, details, but the question that came up is, what challenges or needs faced by young people and youth workers have started to emerge given the context of COVID-19? All right, it's huge. Um, and I'll try and keep it a bit structured because we've got the youth as youth um, and COVID itself, which I'll come to. And then you've got youth workers, both as youth workers, some of whom may be youth themselves and then members of families and communities. Um, the COVID experience is new to any of us, and it's pretty much impossible for anyone to be an expert on COVID. It's impossible. Um, it, it's totally new. And initially when COVID started, okay, so there's this infection that has a high risk of infection and spread around the world. It's got a name. Is it coronavirus? Is it novel coronavirus? Is it the new coronavirus? Then it became COVID-19. Um, what does COVID-19 stand for, which I should quickly drop, stands for CO, the CO bit is Corona, VI, virus, D for disease, and then 19. And the WHO has decided, okay, um, they don't want to actively stigmatize populations. Um, the river Ebola in Africa is done. That river is labeled forever. Um, and other forms of flus and so on. So we had something that has a real world potential to threaten life, regardless of who you are. And for youth, 
and their parents and everyone around the world, it's not a pathological anxiety that many people are dealing with because people do die. Um, COVID, some people who get infected die. And we were caught up in a whole situation where there was hunger for information from public sources, from the WHO, public health. Um, and we've got generational differences and even seeking um, information. So you've got those who are nimble on the internet and so on, checking out information very eagerly um, and swimming in all that information. You've got health professionals looking to China and Italy and so on. Then we've got all these numerical counts and it's not a league table. Um, every single number we see of people dying, families grieving, um, immense distress and, and I'll share personal experience later on. Um, so it, it, it's tough. And when we've got a situation that poses real world threats to young people, real world threats to um, youth workers and clinicians and family, and then a whole culture change in the way we live. So it was the mantra of wash your hands, 20 seconds, wash your hands. Social distancing, which was pretty much grabbed from social sciences. I think it's physical distancing. Um, social distancing is an experience on its own that we can come back to later on. But we had all that going on and then the mandatory bits of how infectious is it, if you cough, if you sneeze. And so it's a big unknown and unknown situations evoke anxiety for, for, for many people, for, for most of us. Uh, we have, and they have youth workers trying to be very professional, care for youth. And most people I know who work with youth are passionate about it. You know, they really give their soul. It's, it's more than work. It's mentorship. It's coaching, companionship. Um, youth workers touch people's lives. Um, and it, it, certainly in my career, I have seen so many people who were given hope not by a family member, not by many mental health professionals, but a kind youth worker who probably took time just to be with mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Yet for the youth workers, they're being mandated to stay home or they've gone on vacation and they're having to quarantine for 14 days. They've got kids of their own or you know, they may have a spouse or family they don't want infected or elderly vulnerable parents and people who may be immunocompromised. So the whole experience of COVID-19 threats, perception of threats, real or not, um, the anxiety with it is real and, and a tough experience for all of us. Are we beginning to normalize it a bit? Yes, in, in some ways. Um, and then there's lockdown and the isolation that goes with it, which we'll probably touch on more. And it, it's, Evolving change, you know, do you wear a mask? What sort of mask? N95 or non-N95? How far can a sneeze go? What's the velocity of a sneeze? What's an aerosol? What's an airdrop? And so on. The infodemic outpaced the pandemic. And we, we can talk about that a bit more, you know, depending on what you ask or what, how the conversation goes. But it, it gets really, really tough. And I guess it's a lesson for all of us. No one's immune from the effects. It's really calling on the best of humanity. Um, social class goes out the window. If you belong to a community, you're part of the COVID clan, at risk clan. If you don't belong to a community, it's a different world to be. Um, but, and I'd say through this, we've also had unsung heroes. Um, th there's an anecdote I don't even want to ever forget saying, so I'll say it now. In my workplace, we have a program where the cleaning staff, actually not called cleaning staff, they refer to as business associates, and every single one of them is a person with lived experience. Um, they wear the same ID badge as I do. They have access to my office they clean and keep the system going. And we've got an employment scheme and program for them. And there's a guy who would come round, touch points, contact points, clean six times, seven times. And I said, goodness, I mean, you're really, really committed so much of this. And the guy said, you know, hey, hey doc, this is the least I can do. If I can keep you guys healthy and safe, then you guys 
can also provide care to others. I'm gonna keep it real. He left the room and a tear went down my cheek. As this was someone dealing with his own emotional distress and mental health issues, given selflessly. Um, and without a shadow of doubt, he was a frontline worker. Does this guy recognize as a frontline worker? Probably not. You know, when people clap and celebrate frontline workers, do people like him get recognized? Possibly not. But he was selfless. And I actually challenged within our, one of our meetings that how many of us show the sort of commitment this person and colleagues do selflessly through their own anxiety and distress in working towards COVID? So in summary, um, to your question is a long answer. Um, COVID is a, a pandemic, it's international. It's testing the best of communities around the world. Um, it's anxiety provoking a, in a transgenerational way. Um, youth look up to older people sometimes um, and across the generations for guidance. The information nimble in a way older people may not be. Youth workers constantly give of themselves um, to support youth and worth saluting. Long answer, short question. Brilliant, brilliant. And it was really helpful to get a lot of the context. And uh, I'm encouraging people, as we're going through the conversation, please share your questions in the chat box on Facebook Live as well, because this is a, a conversation. Um, wonderful context. Some things are coming to mind. I know um, Katie has a question, but I wonder if you can kind of fill in some context around what does it mean to have like cultural mental health as an approach? And ultimately, like we will talk about how um, youth workers and young people are navigating this environment. But perhaps just before that, that framework of cultural mental health, we can talk a little bit about that because that's also going to be integrated in our presentation in terms of looking at uh, specific communities and how they're dealing with this when we have compounding challenges. Yeah, um, I'll give a briefer response and then we can build on a bit. Um, many communities, many groups have cultures of their own. Uh, you look at a city like Toronto or London, um, there are subcultures within cultures. Um, then you've got youth cultures um, or a community I've grown very fond of and that has embraced me down the road from us in Kingston. Um, you know, Tandinaga, Mohawk Territory, and so on. And we've met with new challenges because we've got a pandemic which is international. Um, the attempts to sort of label it in a geographical sense in such a way that it sort of primes our people from that geography with reference to China and considerable cultural implications. Um, you have different groups with different social determinants of health and disadvantage. Um, some people, for instance, are able to self-isolate on a yacht, stock up food, be on a yacht or a boat on Lake Ontario for weeks on end. Um, others are through social deprivation otherwise, um, are trying to isolate with six people within maybe 18 square meters, um, where it's absolutely impossible to keep two meters apart. Um, the knowledge and awareness of the pandemic and measures some groups have had way better access to health information and resource. Some have never found anything in the language they understand. Um, and there have been a lot of innovation. I'm aware of someone I've noticed on the platform, for instance, who did a lot of work translating resources to other languages to allow people who may be culturally or linguistically disadvantaged um, to be able to embrace this. Also within cultures and the infodemic of the pandemic, there have been various bits of misinformation. I mean, there's a time early in COVID, a lot of what I heard was black people don't get COVID. It's a white man's disease. You know, it never does black. Um, and such misinformation actually left some groups vulnerable to not being prepared um, or taking risks they erstwhile shouldn't have taken. So you can't 
divorce or separate culture, which is the way we think our value systems, our behaviors, our social engagements, bits that influence our identity. You can't divorce that from COVID or um, pandemic phenomena like this. You, you just can't. Yeah, Deji, I was thinking when you were talking about how this is something we're all touched by, but of course we're all touched by it in different ways. Um, and depending on intersections of um, our identity, you know, obviously there is greater risk. Um, and you know, thinking about frontline workers, and, and Cyril and I have been talking to youth workers who have had to pivot in their work because the needs of young people have shifted. So obviously having in-person after-school programming has, has become something that's not possible, um, but maybe families um, and individuals within a community might need access to emergency food programs. And so then um, youth workers are, are pivoting and becoming resource navigators for accessing those services. I'm wondering in your own work, like, you know, you know, as personal as you're comfortable sharing, how, how have you had to pivot or have you had to pivot? Was there a time where you weren't able to um, connect with the young people who you work with or how have you, have, have the needs shifted? Are you, are you finding that you're responding in, in different ways over the last few months? Yeah, um, sh surely. So it's certainly not been business as usual um in more ways than one and you gave a really good example one of the critical interventions and i was fortunate to be part of a management team looking at interventions in, in the community one of the most critical early interventions was food security um, and it, it's amazing when you work with social workers and other people in other sectors in a community spirit it's really amazing how much we as mental health professionals don't tap into in community resources. Um, it, it came to food security. Where's the food? How can people get food supply regularly? Um, who has allergies? Um, how much do they have of tinned food and, and so on? Um, there were the things like, okay, there's the advice to wash hands. Does everyone have soap? Um, do they? Don't they have soap? Um, are people able to isolate um, or if they're shifting or sofa surfing, do they get kicked out of a home because they're not able to? And then the clinical consults, um, seeing patients, okay, clients were not able to come into the premises. Um, do we do home visits? And what personal risk are we taking in, in home visits? Um, doing home visits in PPE is weird. It's really, really weird. And the very first consult I did wearing PPE, I really don't know who was more anxious, whether it was the client or me, because I had a mask on. Um, you know, all the person could see was the slit of my eyes, trying to read who I was. The person was really unwell. And the person told me point blank, you know, how do I know you're a doctor? All my career I've seen doctors, no one dresses this way. Um, and the person had poor pandemic uh, COVID literacy and really was very, very suspicious. Or someone who's really unwell and you're trying to encourage the person to wear a mask and the person rips it off. And so why did you rip it off? So because how do I eat with it on? Or how do I smoke with it on? Um, or someone that you're trying to describe and explain that it's a, a virus of some sort. And the person feeling really insulted, you know, I don't sleep around doctor. How could I get a virus? And then you've got even the inter, in, interprofessional bits. Um, no one wanting another colleague in their own space. You know, so, okay, you guys will respect each other as colleagues, but my, oh my, everyone's trying to keep alive um, and well. So there was food security. There were, um, we had to be really, really innovative and um, with wellness related issues. So how do people manage social isolation? Um, and, and that was tough. And it's really interesting where we get the skill sets. A, a person who's served um, a custodial sentence or a young person who's served a custodial sentence probably has more to teach a psychiatrist about what it's like to be in solitary and how to while away time and, and, you know, and remain mentally active than what you'll learn in books. You know, what, what, what do you do 
when you're in isolated space? Um, how do you stay connected? And we had a program um, where we were able to try and get cell phones available to people who were not connected, um, which was a great program. We were able to drop off some. Now, amongst one of our clients' clusters, only 14% had a personal device that could actually carry a video call. So you couldn't even do video consults on them because they just didn't have the bandwidth or the contract to do it. So it was a great idea, but implementation was really, really difficult for these young people. Some people flat right declined the phones because they said, ah, oh, it's probably loaded with 5G and then I'll get the COVID from Point of correction, you don't get COVID from 5G. I'm just saying what the misinformation was, um, but they were suspicious of that. So it, it's been quite a lot of adjustments. And then those who may be frequent heavy users of a substance like cannabis or those who were using crystal meth and so on, supply chains were disrupted. Um, some were stocking up on stuff. Some were looking for alternatives. Um, the, the weed man, in quotes, learned to do contactless transactions, some were doing using a fishnet to extend and, and stay apart. So it's been new learning for all of us as practitioners. We've all had to make adjustments while being members of the real world, probably known people who've been infected or passed away and so on. So certainly not business as usual. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about what you mentioned earlier, how you know, the phrase social distancing became one that everyone was using, but that there is a difference between physical distancing and actually being socially isolated and how so many people and probably a lot of folks joining us today may have had their own experiences with that, um, navigating that and using technology as a way to connect, but then also wanting to limit their use of technology because of what you described as sort of the infodemic and how how have you been speaking with folks around how to navigate, you know, how much information, what information, how to be critical about the information that you're receiving? I know a lot of people talk about the news as being something um, to avoid, but that's also a primary way to understand how context and circumstances are changing and also to be engaged in issues of racial and social justice during this time. So how, you know, what conversations have you had with folks around the infodemic? Well, it's been a really, really tough one because when you're home, possibly alone, um, and you try and kept, keep um, aware of what's going on around the world, you take information. There were people taking on 9, 10, 12 hours of COVID news. Um, someone asked me, uh, really, really anxious, that if everyone goes into lockdown or a country is closed down at the time Italy had been in lockdown, but what happens to people in that country? Are they evacuated? You know, how do they survive? And people were really, really scared. And it was causing insomnia. People would wake up at 2 a.m. and check the most recent COVID news. Um, people would ask, you know, so how many people have died in Ontario, in, in Kingston? And that, that sense that here it is, it's on its way, you know, this apocalypse. And it is apocalyptic in some parts of the world. Uh, we've been incredibly fortunate so far. We'll see what win um, winter brings. But the consumption of the information and misinformation and some of the sophistication of the misinformation. So you'd see a scientific report maliciously edited and, and with the wrong information. So it'll be a true paper, an accurate paper that was published, but someone then altering the stats um, and the results to read the exact opposite. Um, or you've got information like if you wear a mask, it's gonna make your oxygen saturation drop and then it can cause you brain damage uh, and so on. And then you've got people saying, hold on, I'm a surgeon, I'm a theater nurse. We wear these masks all day. Um, our oxygen sats don't. And it's really difficult because if you're vulnerable, anxious, with so much stress going on, how much critical appraisal can you do? And even as a physician, I'm not equipped to critically appraise every single bit of health information regarding COVID. Um, there's some bits that are easier. So what's the difference between a droplet 
and um, airborne particles. And some of it's slightly academic. So a, a droplet is by WHO definition, five nanometers or more makes a droplet. If it's less than, it becomes an airborne particle. So one is like you think of a droplet like a soccer ball um, or a tennis ball. And then you think of an airborne particle like a golf ball or a table tennis um, ball. And so those sort of details, they influence the sort of mass we wear and so on. But critically appraising this is tough. We have examples being given, for instance, two meters. And we've got an international study going on known as the calibration of visually internalized distance. Did you get that? COVID, calibration of visually internalized distance, which is um, a two meter test and it's been done in 14 countries around the world. And just trying to see how well people can actually estimate what two meters is. And for educational reasons, various forms of literacy, people don't walk around with a tape measure. Many people don't even know what two meters is. And we've found really, really shocking findings, um, had shocking findings where people's capacity to actually apply these guidances have been really difficult. Some people have educational impairments and you know, one centimeter and 12 meters are the same thing. They, they don't, um, so there's so many vulnerable people, people who are visually impaired trying to make these judgments. And I, I think we should carefully think of the vulnerable around us who aren't able to even process the core information um, not to talk of the more sophisticated bits. And it really is an opportunity for knowledge translation and very considered, careful thinking of vulnerable groups um, across different cultures to ensure they're safe. Because one thing's a given with a pandemic. If you've got a weak link, no one sleeps at night. We're also figuring this out in, in real time. Mm -hmm. And so this is all sort of unfolding. And, and as you said, like your own capacity to, you know, be able to critically appraise information as it comes out and then translate that to other folks. And I think, you know, that's something that we're all feeling challenged by depending on our roles and our responsibilities and who we, you know, seek comfort from and our, you know, um, and also seek to comfort um, can be challenging. Yep, I'll say the best education I've ever had on understanding a virus was from a client. Um, and this is someone who actually had a master's anonymous in virology, who then developed a mental disorder. And this person knew it. I mean, I learned so much. And I refer to him as, you know, my, my virus professor. Um, so there's also knowledge residing in places we don't think. Thank you. Talking about knowledge, um, most of the audiences I understand are youth workers, um, mostly in Ontario, but we do have a guest from around the world. If we're starting to think about some very practical strategies, some advice of some things to try when we're approaching um, youth work, what are some areas that you would recommend we pay more attention to? Um, or maybe you can give some testimonials about some practices that you've integrated that have um, been successful. Yeah, youth work should never be engaged from a position of entitlement. And the fact that we've all been youth before doesn't entitle us to work with youth. Um, likewise, the fact that we're older than should, doesn't mean we can patronize. And people say, oh, well, I was once a young person your age. But yeah, was there an internet then? Was there social media? There probably wasn't or may have been, even if there was. So the world is extremely dynamic. One of the amazing things about youth work is you can get your feedback in real time. You know, um, youth, it, you can try and play games with older people and, and so on. If you earn your relationship in, in youth work, you earn your trust. Um, and sometimes it's really, really tough. Um, I'm going to go all African on you, apologies. Uh, no apologies, for correction, no apologies. Onisurulung from Warakino. It's a Yoruba Nigerian saying, which pretty much means it takes utmost patience, skill, perseverance, and, and um, trust to milk a lioness. 
So if you go diving in with a sense of entitlement, you're not going to. Um, there's some cliche phrases, you know, nothing about us without us. And the youth mental health movement now recognizes that youth in their own right can actually guide youth work. Uh, they have a major voice at the table. Um, they're at a mature enough age, and even if some may not be very mature, but they, many are smart enough, engaged enough, emotionally intelligent enough to be able to let guide you to do what's best or how you can better support them. So youth work isn't an entitlement. You can go with all the titles, you, you, you know, youth don't care what you know till they know that you care. And methods of engaging, I've had a few pretty rewarding ones. And um, I did some interesting work with the Brit School in the UK that's, okay, generated musicians like, can I name drop? I'm not saying they were in the school then, but you know, Ed Sheeran, Adele and so on. Um, and in the Brit School, one thing I left the Brit School with was a capacity to beatbox. No, I'm not gonna do it now. <laughs> But um, just even therapeutic engagement. And there was a program we had, which I've developed here in Kingston as well, where we're using beats. So mm -hmm. classical psychotherapy, you know, you've got the guy on the couch or sofa in free association saying how much he worries about this or grandpa, grandma, mum and dad and so on. And for youth, just the concept of time is just so different. Um, so what, what we're able to do with a professional musician in town who's really good was to develop a library of beats. Three minutes rounds of beats with different genres and tempos and so on. And you got people just spitting a rhyme. Hmm. Um, I use the word spit and I can see people in COVID times recoiling <laughs> from their computers. Um, but you know, the, there's a beat going... And someone's freestyling over it and I had a young person freestyle and when we slowed down the lyrics okay why don't we just look at that song the person was actually singing you know the chorus was mama 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 why didn't give me a hug mm. what I wanted from you mama was to give me a hug and that person would never tell a psychiatrist or a therapist that I wish my mom hugged me uh, or another person who's beat involved you know looking for a person's eyes and when we slowed it down and talked about it this person had poured whiskey on an old woman on a bus and felt so much guilt that the person had been searching the eyes of older women all over town to try and locate the person to apologize and the person's incredibly distressed by covid and wearing masks because it's more difficult to see the face and wants to get that across so the point I make from these illustrations is youth work involves being innovative. Um, youth will coach us about what platforms or what works for them. And I've actually taken on an initiative where I've got some youth mentors. So they mentor me and then they're my youth coaches as well. Um, because in 2020, a bald headed, pot bellied man with a salt and pepper gray beard ain't going to cut it um, in youth world without their guidance. But Desi, how do you use, like, you know, we talk about use of self and navigating, you know, these ideas of professional boundaries in working with young people. And of course, we want to make sure that, you know, both youth workers and youth are, are safe. Um, but but how, do we, how do we use ourselves, especially in a time where we, we may be experiencing our own anxieties, our own uncertainties, our own grief, um, or anger, and how, how, do you, how, do, how do we do that work in a way that still is being mindful of, of the fact that there is a boundary in the relationship? It, it, it's tough, and um, pro professionalism certainly at all times. Um, that must be at the core of whatever we do, and we can innovate and yet be professional, and there will be times they'll cut you deep, really, really, really deep. Um, I'll, I'll give an example, just personal disclosure, but I'm comfortable with it. Um, one of my best friends in the UK, um, who was probably one of the best mental health advocates, barristers I, I know, 
really close friend who's also a professional musician, Cough Cough, played the bass guitar for David Bowie, um, died of COVID. And I was wrecked. Um, I got the news while I was in my office and I, I, I was angry. Now, to then start working with a young person an hour after hearing that news, and the person says, you know, hey doc, all this COVID stuff is just SH1T. There's no such thing as COVID. It's just a conspiracy and so on. And I, I had a volcano of anger and I had to be really professional not to take out on the young person. And what I, it was an opportunity to do then is, you know, really double down to help the person understand in a such a way there wasn't going to be more pain and anger but it can be tough tough on boundaries um for youth workers they'll some of the youth are going to be the same age as their kids um, or younger siblings or they see themselves really identify with the person and the person's narrative may mirror theirs 5 10 15 20 years earlier so it's tough and i'll say peer support um, trust in peer support within different organizations. Um, I use the word supervision, not in a position of power, um, but supervision whereby, and, and a sense of safety whereby we can openly and vulnerably acknowledge our uncertainty, anxiety, grief, challenges that we're dealing with through this period. And um, that goes a long, long, long way. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, you shared a bit of your personal experience um, with the impact of this virus. You've spoken about your professional resolve in terms of helping others navigate while you're also navigating your own journey. Um, and I think that's part of the conversation where we have youth workers that are supporting, they're on the front lines, but they also have their own story. There's a lot going on behind the scenes and sometimes that's ignored. You spoke about a frontline worker uh, who are the unsung heroes. Um, and so maybe even from a personal place, um, there's a question of like, what is motivating you to do this work? Where are you drawing some energy from in terms of a source to be able to do the work and be well? Good question. In my head, what I answered, and I'll say what went on in my head, the answer that came out in my head was people like you. Um, you know, this, when it's done a community spirit of compassion, kindness, it's really so rewarding working with younger people, um, nurturing. The reality is whether we acknowledge or not, we'll grow older, they're our future. We can complain as much as we like um, our legacy um, so, for instance, through the history and passage of time and the filter, for instance, of issues to do with race and so on, mm -hmm. um, I must serve as a filter for the generation coming behind. If I end up being part of a generation that dumps on the next, goodness, what was, what was it worth? Um, so I'll say a network of good, trusting friends. There can't be too many in, in the real world. Um, moments of personal mindfulness, mm -hmm. staying connected, um, and my personal coping. I'm, there are times I'm, I just head out on a four and a half hour trek. Camera, mm -hmm. you know, binoculars or bird book, and I'm in the woods, just clearing my head of gunge uh, and so on, staying connected with friends and family abroad. Um, I'd say for those who may be managers and leaders of organizations here, um, compassion, 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 compassion. It can be so tough in people's homes with all that's going on. You know, a person may be absolutely committed to work. You've got a spouse who's caring for the kids. The kids are really tired of mom and dad's home tuition and realize actually for all dad or mom's bravado, they're actually no good at math. Um, and so on. So it's a really a naturally long, high pressure situation. And I'll say 
connectedness. Um, if we all have a kind person around us, someone who's compassionate, someone we can entrust, and having made reference to math, also a very crude formula that I use as well. It's simplistic, but it works for me. You know, um, think of the math symbols. So plus, does a person add to your life? Keep close. Um, does a person multiply you and strengthen you? Keep close. Does this person subtract from you? It's okay if you've got a full tank of you know, your mobile charge is 100%. But if you're running on low, maybe 5%, and someone's trying to subtract 10 from you, okay, cool off. Keep a, keep a bit of distance for a while at least. Does a person square you? And so on. Does a person divide you? Keep a bit of gap even if, if it's for now, because we don't have limitless resources. Our mental health through this period is absolutely critical. Um, how we and what ways we achieve mental floss, not dental, but mental floss, mm. is a really personal experience. And just staying connected, someone, you know, you think of someone, hi, I'm just thinking of you. Um, I've had some of my most close supportive COVID conversations with some of my childhood friends from Australia. And we, we have two weekly Zoom meetings. And it, it's uncut, you know, these are people, we don't care, it, it's totally uncut. And they can ask me point blank, you know, DJ, you're afraid. And then someone says, yeah, well, a bit, I've been worried. Yeah, and then someone says, because I'm scared. <laughs> and. And having people that like that so that you can be authentic, be yourself with. So we can co-inspire each other. And I'd say this really, if people are going through tough, challenging times, this is not the time to bring down the force of performance management without showing empathy to understand what people are going through. It, it may be no fun at all working from home. Everyone's working from home and using you know, video conferencing. I, I may live in the most shanty town, you know, basements with clutter around things. And I don't want to Zoom. I, oh, I don't want to use WebEx and those platforms as someone's got a, an amazing looking living room like, you know, Cyril's or Kate's. Kate's. <laughs> so, yep, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I relate to that. What I use this is actually a, a full disclosure. <laughs> We're keeping it real, right? Yep. This is a virtual background. It's a green screen. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, not everybody has access to a place that's comfortable or, um, you know, that's, that's in terms of resources and technology. Those are also barriers. Thank you, um, Deji, for sharing about some of your methods that you use to keep grounded and keep focused and stay energized. And, you know, maybe there's no end to talking about some of the challenges that we're encountering, but we've talked about limitations in technology, and you've spoken about a program where cell phones are available. Um, and so there's opportunity, there's challenge. Those are the themes that we've been exploring with all these conversations. Um, and uh, it's a dynamic space. And in some of our conversations, we've really been identifying areas of opportunity of how can we do our work, but maybe even do it better, in, this, in a sense, than we were doing it before. Um, appreciate that you're talking about compassion and balancing these priorities of like performance review and critique and also having that human lens on what we're experiencing. There's some things that we just don't know about what somebody is going through um, and you know what's worth it in terms of how to uh, meet our goals from an organizational standpoint but also not to forget our humanity and our gr greater purpose you know or calling in this life. So you know thank you for sharing that. Thank you. There is space for people to ask questions. We have um, about just over 30 minutes left and there's another topic, there's another area that I think we should start delving into and I'm encouraging people on Facebook Live and um, directly in Zoom, please ask some questions. Um, we will invite you to turn your camera on. If you just raise your hand um, in the chat function, we will invite you to turn your camera on if you're comfortable um, to turn your mic on and share. Um, in a speaking order, just so that we can do uh, the conversation in an orderly way. The next topic that we want to start touching on is looking about uh, looking around mental health. Yes, we have the context of the global pandemic, but there's also some very dynamic movements happening when it comes to identity politics, with uh, conversations around race, specifically, 
Um, in the last few days, again, there have been more eruptions around police brutality targeting um, people of the African diaspora, specifically in North America in this context. And I, it's a very intimate link to social media. And having this tool that many people have, maybe they have live video turned on and it's streaming traumatic images and fears and concerns directly into um, a daily routine potentially. Um, I'll, I'll share myself, like we don't know anybody's story, right? So I was up until about 2 a.m. this morning on a call supporting a very close person to me around navigating that violence. And um, it's, it's extreme, but you, it's, there's, there's surface level information where we have an idea that something is happening and people are going through something. But when it's closer to home, it really, really impacts the mental health, well-being, and peace and safety, literal safety of people and, and people's lives. So we have this broader discourse about what does it mean to have a united country and what does it mean to have second-class citizens, but we also have the real immediate impact of what does it mean for your mental health as a racialized or a Black youth worker that is doing frontline youth work or doing some professional service where you feel that your own life may be on the line or may be uh, unvalued uh, uh, and taken for granted, how do you navigate that? How do you navigate it when you feel your people close to you or perhaps your children are having their lives threatened daily with a system that you are choosing to comply with, yet uh, many conversations around that social contract being broken where you play by the rules, but you never can win the game. Why play? And I know a lot of young people are like, why bother? Like, I'm, I'm going off a lot. There's a lot of streams you can go through when it comes to this question of your expectations um, or your right to social justice and then the assault of violence that is experienced mentally through the streams of social media and the wider context of what we've been seeing over the last few months. Do you have anything to uh, contribute in the ways of how youth workers, community members, young people are consuming social media, how this message is perhaps having an impact on mental health? What a question. Okay, you're gonna cut me off. Um, so here I am on the dissection table. <laughs> um, it's tough. It's really, really tough. It's mentally exhausting. Um, even before the pandemic, it was tough. And for many people, being black, because I think that's all we're talking about, being black is a full-time job. You know, you wake up, you're conscious of your skin, and it's a full-time job. Um, regardless of your status in society or the community, um, because what people see first are your visual attributes, um, your visible attributes before getting to know the other details. And, and it's tough. Um, there's not a single black person I know who's not had experiences of racism. Um, which have left them challenged, traumatized, deeply worried, concerned, fearful. And when we have a series of events that generate and perpetuate daily the concept of fear. Now, if you layer one bit of fear, we spoke about fear and anxiety that comes from a virus. So fear um, or the issues that go on, it's really tricky. Um, there are very few parents with a, a black child who've not contemplated at least once their child's not coming back home. Um, there are many parents who night after night when the child goes out, they're sitting there worried. Um, and they're not sleeping until the child walks through the door. Um, there are people who, with the best of intent, have given everything their all and been met by situations and, with a sense of perceived or real injustice. Um, there are experiences daily of microaggressions, microtraumas. And these are things, it nearly takes living it to understand it. So here you are, you're in a shopping mall, everyone pays cash before you, and then you pay cash, and the person is checking your money, 
six, seven times, and I use as a sort of identity pen on it. Um, you're in a mall or you're shopping and there's a security guard in your peripheral vision. And each aisle you go, the person's in an aisle behind you or watching you. Um, you learn very, very early as a young black person to have your hands visible at all times. Um, you know, you don't want anyone thinking you just put something in your pocket or you just shoplifted and so on. You're accustomed to being on a train or a bus and so on, knowing full well that the last seat to go is going to be the one next to you. Um, day in, day out, you go in situations and regardless of what you wear or look like, there's an attribution that you're not who you are. And um, those examples aren't even from youth. The examples I've given, they, that's my day-to-day -day life. I can't even imagine leaving home without an ID on me. I'll think of ID before my phone. <laughs> um, because how, how do I say I'm who I am? Now, exposed to very distressing images, really distressing images. Um, and hey, who am I to judge? Many situations, we don't know all the facts, but they are distressing. Um, and when these are repeated and perpetuated, there are narratives behind this that embed. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not the big, big bits, you know, there have been gruesome, gruesome, gruesome deaths. Um, but alongside that, not bust, but alongside that, you have people who have really worked hard job applications and either the name didn't fit or there's a perception that the person is big, black and dangerous going on. Um, or activities that may occur even in school. Mm -hmm. And I've promised myself, I'm not gonna forget this example because for me, it's incredibly relevant. Um, so here you are, you're committed to going to school. You're really committed to taking part um, and getting the best education you can get. And you're doing literature. And part of your literature is to study the book, um, To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, who's that book for? And just quick points from the book. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird has the N word in it 48 times. I can say the N word, but I'll be polite here. 48 times. It has N lover nine times. To Kill a Mockingbird has equipped young people vocabulary to use on their, for their allies. So if you have a white ally to a black person, um, and kids have told me their friends being called N lovers. Vocabulary they picked up from literature in class. The word Negro 25 times, for instance. And um, given that it's, it's part of literature, so this is even in the classroom um, as part of curriculum. These are my personal views, and I'll read out this bit. So consider, here I am, a beautiful young person, youth, in a classroom, and this is what we're reading from To Kill a Mockingbird. What's a mixed child? Half white, half colored. You've seen him, Scout. You know, that red kinky-headed one that delivers for the drugstore is half white. They're really sad. Sad, how come? They don't belong anywhere. Colored folks won't have them because they're half white. White folks won't have them because they're colored. So they're just in, in betweens, don't belong anywhere. So that's an example of a description of a mixed race person. And here I am in the classroom, the only mixed race child in that class. What's that doing to my mental health? Or another example, just three lines below that one. Um, a small boy clutching a Negro woman's hand walked toward us. He looked all Negro to me. It was rich chocolate with flaring nostrils and beautiful teeth. Hmm. Now, what's the educational value of that? Every single young, younger black person I know, male and female within my networks um, that I've connected with in the UK, the US, Ireland and Canada, have given some descriptions of having done that in literature in school. 
most of them told me they buried the memory. They don't want to ever remember that book. Some had told me they never read it. One told me he burns his. Um, one said, mom said, I shouldn't do, do it. Take the poor grades um, or just use resource material from the internet and so on. And so whose learning is it? Um, where the narrative starts with a white woman being raped by a black man uh, and so on. So the, what I'm saying is there's so much across the board um, that actually permeates our attitudes, our learning very early in life. Because if you've got that imprinted and you've done as literature and reading for two years in high school, wow, attitudes are forming. And okay, you can say it was framed in the 1930s and the Deep South, but there's some amazing Canadian writers. There's some really amazing um, indigenous writers and material that really enrich, you know, that take you into beautiful parts of the country that really enrich your humanity and, and so on. What I'm saying may be controversial. Others may view a book like that differently, but I'd say from the majority of young black people I've worked with, although I know and I've spoken with, who've been in class as either the only black person or mixed race, that book has had an adverse effect on their emotional wellness. For some, it's contributed to very specific bullying and many, if not the majority, have tried to repress it. Food for thought. Thank you for sharing that. I remember my mom telling me about um, this book called Little Black Sambo that she had to um, do in school. And uh, I'm not familiar with the book, but just like, so my parents have been, you know, that trauma that they've experienced, I've learned about it in terms of these caricatures that are framed. And um, it's, it's not just the fact that these narratives of dehumanizing blackness that are attached to people that are black that have this racialization, are continuing in all forms of media in educational institutions and in entertainment, music, film, et cetera. It's also the fact that our educators, our supporters that are not aware of the significance of that impact, do nothing to confront it, do nothing to problematize it. And if you leave these texts as is without critically dissecting them, um, you're almost reinforcing them. Um, I think, yeah, I, that's a whole conversation in terms of the violence. We're, we're looking at social media and we're seeing um, people that are being murdered by law enforcement on the streets. But I often think about what happens with the psychological, not murder, but maiming of people in classroom settings uh, daily that are you know, told from the very beginning, you're not enough or you're not full and you're not complete. And, and what does that do to somebody's individual psychology? What does that do to family structures, to community? And that's not paying uh, being paid attention to because it's not being recorded in the same way. We'll keep um, it real. Um, quick comment on that. I saw an anonymous person yesterday with two colleagues who gave such a narrative. For those two colleagues, it was the very first time they heard such a narrative from the heart and soul. The young person left the room and was tissues to the eyes for every professional there. Now, this person had had a reputation for not engaging for not, you know, connecting and so on. And when this person shared a narrative of being in high school and the reason for school avoidance being finding a banana peel in his locker every day. Um, and just felt, you know, school became so aversive. And this someone who's really keen on an education that stopped going to school, um, conveniently was spotted by a weed runner person to be a runner and then got into an alternative industry and well the rest is history um, so these things are happening every single day across the spectrum um, they're tough for professionals as well really really tough for professionals and um this is by no means a pity story about me you know i'm sufficiently resourced from social class and my own life's experiences and emotional experience to go through the mill many times and come out bruised, battered, but not mangled. But a quick illustration, when you're 
going into a situation for a homicide as an expert witness in a suit um, with an ID. And the first thing that happens when you turn up is someone asks whether you were the person that committed the homicide. And you think, wow, what, you know, was the suits that shabby? Um, and of course, I had to then help the person understand, well, maybe we should credit the system for the rehabilitation program I went through. So I got retrained as a physician and now as a psychiatrist. And, and then the person realized, oops, too late. So it, it's tough. And what I'm saying is actually using these experiences to have empathy. Um, th they're terms used, and many of us will be familiar with them. Um, you know, what it means to be a coconut brown on the outside, white on the inside, uh, or bounty bar, or in other terms used. And they're derogatory, and how do you manage your own identity? You know, do I fully get the black experience? You're kidding, no. You know, did I grow up in a neighborhood where people were getting shot? No. Uh, am I relatively privileged? Yes, yes, yes. Um, but do I have a rough sense, or am I do I enable myself to listen to black narrative whereby I can have enough sense of social responsibility to use the resource available to me to be an advocate? Yes. And I, I think if there was just a hashtag, hashtag, just listen, just listen, no, just listen, listen to stories with empathy, listen to the experiences with mindfulness, try and feel what the person's going through you'll hear more than you can ever hear. And with social media and all these things that you can loop and play over and play over and play over and play over, they're taking a mental toll. And when we talk of intergenerational trauma and with absolute respect and regard to our First Nation, Métis, and other populations um, online and other groups, um, there are so many complex forms of intergenerational trauma. Um, you've got the abuse passed down through generations, but you can also have intergenerational trauma where you have three generations of a household. You know, grandpa went through tough experiences. Dad's trying to be the best dad he can be. And he's watching his own son go through experiences. And some of these things over social media and news are hitting three generations at the same time. Um, and it's tough. It really is tough. Um, I've asked, and, and again, I'm just speaking for me, I've asked so many people, if you had to take one out of the system forever, COVID or experiences of racism, which will you take? And people of color and, and people of black heritage, nearly universally, they'd rather live with COVID. You know, take away the racism, and make life feel more balanced. I'm not saying it's everyone, it's tough. I'm, you know, I don't want to oversimplify really, really complex phenomena. Um, it's keeping it real to say there are also people of color who have very strong views about white people and people have diverse experiences. Um, and a lot of this comes to shades of gray, but it, it's tough and it's tough even as psychiatrists, even as social workers, even as youth workers, um, where does your identity sit and how do you work with this? It's tough. It's tough when you turn up on a, um, and I'll probably make a quick intersectional point. Um, some, about a month ago, I needed an emergency dental appointment and my record read some line, you know, psychiatrist, early psychosis intervention program or so. And there I was, in that famous vulnerable position in a dentist's chair, you know, reclined with the lights shining in your eyes, and the dental assistant, you know, dressed up in PPE, walks aside, whispers something to the dentist, I'm wondering, goodness, what on earth is my mouth about to explode? What do they see? And I see them in a little huddle in my peripheral vision. And the dentist comes back and says, um, I understand you've been treated for a psychotic illness. Um, we just need the details of your psychiatric medication um, so that we can be careful with the anesthesia you use. Now, initially, I, I loved it. I thought, man, this guy's got crazy humor. You know, wow, he's trying to really relax me. 
<laughs> um, and then realized he was really serious. Said, um, I see from your record you were treated for psychosis. Um, I said, psychosis? Who said that? Where did you get that from? So he then went back to read the record. Said, oh, really sorry, it was psychosis, early psychosis intervention. Um, oh, you're, you're a doctor, you're a psychiatrist. Yes. And from then on, it was, okay, doctor, yes, doctor, okay, doctor, yes, doctor. So there I was in the sort of crossfire of a guy who probably didn't look like a doctor, didn't look like a psychiatrist, um, and whatever blackness comes with that or not, plus the assumption that I had a mental disorder. And I thought, goodness, is this meant to be my audition for, you know, Silence of the Lambs? Am I maybe chewing his arm off or something? So what I say is, I speak from a position of privilege, and even from a pr position of privilege, it can be challenging at times. And we really must spare a thought for those who don't have the resource, who don't, um, who have nothing. And good on every single one of you youth workers who've given kids like that hope, you know, a, a sense to be themselves, you know, being the dad they may not have had, the mum they may not have had, the one person on earth who's believed in them, uh, and so on. It's tough. It really is tough. We had a, a question that I, I want to give voice to that was submitted. Um, and I think you may, have, you may have already spoken to this in other ways, but if you wanted to share anything else, Deji, how do you stay focused on the work and supporting the needs of the youth versus being distracted? at work by your own needs and trauma? Um, I think I've been in the business long enough and really I sort of keep personal stuff away from work. Um, I don't talk about family, I, I, I keep friends, family, those bits don't go to work. Work is, I'm in a zone. And even when I'm interviewing or working with a young person, there may be other people in the room, but I'm in such a bubble. Sometimes it's as if, you know, the conversation ends and then wake up, oh, there are two other people here. It, 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 it's a, I, don't, I, I can't explain how it happens, but there, there's just something there that connects that you're really, I just find, I'm, I'm sure it happens with many of the youth workers as well and many others, so it's not unique to me. But I, I do try and keep the worlds apart. Um, and sometimes, if it's been a really tricky day, avoiding getting home too quickly. So sometimes, you know, you have a mind blowing day and that's a day for, to go on a really good walk or hang out with some chickadees um, or, you know, go by the lake. You just to do something else and not take all that because it, it's tough. And I, I think that's where support um, peer support, feeling safe with someone anywhere in the world where you can pretty much feel comfortable and safe and give yourself permission to be vulnerable. Um, so with our surgeon, Katie and Cyril, for instance, and you guys are amazing therapists, by the way, because there's something about all this, for me also this cathartic, and I can feel my head feeling lighter of burden so whether this is group therapy with one guy you just going yap to yap on um yeah we get better with time also so i manage what i disclose with clients sometimes a narrative can be amazing mm -hmm. um a young person yesterday i used barack obama's journey um as the narrative for his recovery you know so what does it mean being different what does it mean not looking like the other people in the family? What does it mean having a dad that wasn't around in the book, Dreams of My Father, an African dad that you don't see, then an Indonesian stepdad, um, and then moving on and the issue of when do you become black and how Obama was mentored you know, by the barber and then the, you know, the pastor of the church and the important male role models in his life and so on. Um, so, as professionals, we don't have a monopoly over what we do. It, it could be the gentle neighbor. It could be the neighbor's cat or dog that we just spend mindful, quiet moments with. 
Um, it could be, there are many sources of emotional support and, and wellness. Thank you. We have um, a little less than 15 minutes left. And so I wanna encourage people to ask some questions. As people are getting ready to ask their questions, please interrupt us, raise your hand. You can also place a question in the chat or on Facebook Live. Um, we will be talking about the virtual cafe. So some of these conversations can actually continue on that platform. Um, but I encourage people to take advantage of this opportunity and, and join the conversation. Okay. Hi, Rita. Hi. Hello, Rita. Hello. Um, it's not really a question. I'm, I just, um, I wanted to say, I think when you spoke about the example in terms of the survey and uh, most people cho choosing, most black people choosing COVID um, over racism, uh, it really hit home. So I started to think about like, what would have been the rationale? And I think what comes to mind for me is the fact that when it comes to racism as a black person, you don't have a choice. Like you said, you know, you can be of someone who does have some level of privilege, like myself, I'm a senior site manager, um, but I still have to deal with racism on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So with COVID, even though it's a pandemic and it's a very scary thing, there is a level of choice. If I didn't want to catch COVID, right? Mask on, I can choose to be in my house. I can choose to hibernate in my house for six months with my family and I don't have to deal with the uh, um, outside world. But you don't get that choice um, as, you know, as a black person, because you do got to go about your day-to-day -day business and then being black, being young, um, there's just a lot of things that you do deal with. And I can't even, I know we try to keep person on side, but I can even share something um, where I was a young mom and um, my daughter, she's mixed. So her father uh, is Chinese, Spanish, all kinds of stuff. So my daughter came out, and I'm of African descent from Ghana. Uh, my daughter came out looking very Asian, very, very Asian. Uh, so when I used to travel with her to try and go to school, other whites or Asians would see me. And I actually was told that my daughter wasn't mine when I would say she is. Um, and I was told I was actually the nanny and I was lying. Just to share what the experience of being Black can feel like, where you have to justify a child being yours. Um, and even after you justify your being so no, you're lying, you're actually the nanny. Um, and they could have said it's not yours. But the fact that they had to say, I must be the nanny, um, also really speaks to the Black experience. Well, th thank you so much, Rita. And um, just with a dollop of empathy, I, I can consider what your airport experience would be if you're traveling alone with your daughter. Yeah. You know, e e eloping, you know, nanny steals Asian kid. Yeah. Um, and yet here it is, and w I'll take it away from you so it's not too personal, but you know, yeah. with all the maternal love in the world, um, trying to be the best mom or parent someone can be and to have even your parenthood being questioned um, and then imagine a child in a classroom having to deal with that yeah. and um, there are probably people of mixed heritage online and will know many as well um, what does it mean when these dialogues are even going on mm -hmm. you know a, a part of you is black a part of you is white and I remember being asked by a few young people, um, you know, if the dad's white and the mom's black, the person's called black. So yes. So if the dad's black and the mom's white, what's the person called black? So, so why is the person black and not white? Um, and it gets into really interesting dialogue beyond the scope of today, but um, pretty much what the kids are asking is, what's this thing about the one drop? 
mm-hmm. of black blood, you know, just yeah. one drop, just the one drop on the horizon. And, and what are the implications? And it, it, it's complex because also there is black on black. Very few people who've lived all their lives in places like West Africa would understand racism. Yeah. Um, because, you know, those dynamics don't occur. Um, yes, those who've lived in South Africa through the apartheid and so on, um, significantly more so. And um, sometimes, I mean, I've got friends in, in Nigeria who probably have less exposure to some of these daily experiences, and they don't get it. Uh, th- they try to empathize, but they don't, they don't know what it's like. Okay, they go to the UK, they go shopping in high-end places, live in fancy, go to fancy hotels, they have the odd rude experience and say, you know, silly, silly idiot, talking to me like. And, and, <laughs> and then they fly back and they're back to their status without that daily sense of threat. So it, it, it's tough. Um, it, it's tough the way you talk. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my identity could, in a nanosecond, switch right before you. Mm-hmm. So if I continue talking, so Mr. Cyril and um, Sister Kitty, you know, the, the invitation to present today has been very special. And, you know, in fact, it's with much, much gratitude and appreciation because, you know, just to have this chance to be here with all of you is very touching to my heart and so on. Now, within seconds, assumptions we made about my intelligence. Education, so I'm like, oh my God, am I going to listen to this? is great in my ears, and so on. Now, even with language and vocabulary, can come privilege. And I may be not that great in English, but I could be amazing in other languages. And whose knowledge is it? Whose education is it? You could take top professors from Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, choose a university, take them to some university parts of rural Africa, they wouldn't even know how to defecate in the bush. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'll keep the tone. Um, but, you know, but the, just the basics of survival and all the intellect and knowledge applied into another setting could make them illiterate. And I think every single one of us here put in another setting could be compromised. Um, I do some work, as I mentioned, with the Mohawk community here. I have learned so much. And Tandanega is my little Africa. Uh, <laughs> there's just something about the rules there that appeal to my Africanness, the elders, you know, the issues of respect and lines of communication. And, but my oh my, it's been a relationship earned over two and a half years of trust mm-hmm. building. And I, I, don't, I don't feel I'm there yet. There's more to be done. And it's, yeah, I, I, your words probably speak for many. And, you know, just keep on being the amazing mom you are. Um, and th- those are children who grew up through diversity who probably don't need to hear things like what I read earlier from To Kill a Mockingbird in, in the classroom mm-hmm. and have everyone look at them. I remember I was called upon to deliver um, a guest lecture to like some or lesson to some um, high school youth. These were like grade nines and it was a drama class and it was around um, the use of blackface. Um, I'm not going to make any jokes around Canadian politics. Um, Very sensitive time. So blackface being used, but this teacher was framing it in the way that it was just harmless clown makeup. And when I was in the class, this is years ago doing a um, youth program, and I heard that I had conversations with the teacher to be able to attend and um, have some of the historic um, political context of how this is not just innocent clown makeup and performance, but it's actually tied to identity politics and creation of this like foil character, this like what is black? Black is the thing that we think of as negative and it's framed in this social order. Um, and that education is missing if I was a grade nine student and this teacher was just saying blackface was just something about clowning and I was being teased by my peers and at lunchtime, that kind of psychological effect is massive. And I just wanted to insert like that very tiny example of some of the psychological violence that's happening in classrooms. If we're looking at the First Nations community and we're thinking about representation in the curriculum, we're thinking about the importance of understanding um, uh, many cultures. We started talking about cultural mental health 
right? I think if there's one takeaway that we should be looking at, it's how do we complicate our notions of mental health in the sense to have that attunement to cultural context and looking at that in the wider context of this uh, pandemic as it's bringing the communities together and the global um, global communities together because you're going through something similar. How are we, we actually relating to one another? And what is our implementation of empathy and re relating to the other? And we have this very um, sharp example of uh, anti-Black racism that we're speaking to. And there are so many layers of intersectionality that people are struggling with. And, and we have an opportunity now to look at resilience and, and fostering connections. So we do have two questions that are written, I believe, um, Sharon, um, it looks like you wanna say something as well. Um, I just wanna re relay these questions very quickly. We're looking for strategies for fostering resilience and looking for ways to also engage people that are already kind of introverted within themselves. In this context where people are kind of further retreating, are there strategies for showing some care and concern for those that are maybe more isolated. So those are the two questions. And if Sharon, you want to ask the question after that, we'll do that before we close out. Okay, I'll try and keep it quick. So resilience is a tough one. And I, I think when we talk of resilience, I think one thing we should really, really step back and appreciate is, so the resilience means the person's exposed to hardship, challenges, they've got scars, they've been through tough, tough times. Um, and we try and talk people being, again, resilience training and teaching and so on, but how do you teach people to deal with scars they've not even been through? Um, and the all sorts of strategies, either through narrative, real world experience, coaching and so on, regarding resilience. Um, oh goodness, I need to give a more detailed answer beyond the scope of time and I can generate a response. Maybe it's something we should actually build a platform for in youth recs, because it's, it's a real one. There are different ways, there are different ways, gender wise, age wise, and certainly hashtag again, just listen. What's the person's story? How are we helping them strengthen themselves against the blows they've been through? When you tell someone, oh, you're a strong woman. Is that our way of going deaf as well? Oh, she, oh she's such a strong woman. Yeah, but what's she been through? I couldn't handle that, it was me. Yeah, but what's she been through and how are we supporting the person? So the resilience one, forgive me, Rena, who asked. Um, I promise I'll see if I can um, have a platform built to address this better. Um, regarding people who are introverted and COVID, for some people who have sort of got social avoidance, social anxiety disorder and so on, it's a cool, cool zone. I mean, now they're licensed to be home this way. I've got OCD, hand washing and so on, and now it's official. Um, I had someone watching me wipe down a trolley in the supermarket, and I just heard behind me, hey, Dr. A, that's what I do. You don't do it well, I'll show you how to clean a trolley. And we burst into laughter. Um, but for those who are introverted and coming onto these sort of um, platforms, it can be tough. Um, I heard, because the, all the nonverbal communications as well, and the skills required with these platforms, you know, one way is like, I just turn off the video and you can't see me. And as I picked up from one of my postgraduate fellows from Saudi Arabia, he said as a kid, he could spot his mum just through the eyes out of a hundred in seconds. And I think we're all developing new skills through the use of masks to actually learn to read eyes better. You know, we're learning to read, see a smile through the eyes. And I now know that when you smile, the eyes go all crinkly uh, and so on. And how do you see? So there's a lot we're learning um, when we're just students. Every single one of us is in infant school. And there's a lot of cross learning. Woolly response in, <laughs> with time pressure. Um, Thank you so much. We do have the virtual cafe. Um, so we're going to be carrying these conversations to that platform, cafe.youthrex.com. We're going to be sharing an email with all of you that will provide a link. And it will also provide um, some, a guideline for getting on that platform. Sharon, uh, I noticed that you were coming up in the, um, the feed here. Is there anything that you wanted to say before we conclude? 
Okay, thank you so much, Sharon. If you do have something that you'd like to contribute, please bring that to the Virtual Cafe. The Virtual Cafe is this amazing platform. You can create your profile, you can network with other professionals. So everybody that's here, we can all continue to stay in touch. Um, this is the soft launch of the platform. It's not um, public yet in terms of a wide reach. So we are still learning and developing. So we're looking forward to all of you uh, continuing the conversation there. It's 12.31. Um, I will um, look forward to some last words from Deji, if you have anything else to share with us before we conclude the presentation. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for the cathartic experience. Um, this is a really special experience and very humbling. And for you guys serving and supporting youth, thank you. You know, it, it, it's immense work. It may not get valued and so on, but my oh my, for every young person that you give confidence, that you show love to, that you coach and you mentor, um, you're doing something huge. You're making better moms, better dads, better partners, lovers, chief execs, presidents, and so on. So thank you ever so much. Stay safe. And I wouldn't even beatbox my way out because it generates saliva. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much.